Welcome back to Young Heretics, where today I would like to discuss what on earth we are going to do about any of this. <laughs> and when I gesture vaguely and say any of this, I mean all of the stuff that we've been talking about for three weeks now. This is the third part of a three-part series on our present crisis and what the appropriate response is. So just to recap, right, we had an episode about civil disobedience in the name of religious principle that was nonviolent, um, and I was in support of it, right? I argued that there's a long tradition going back to Antigone and Aquinas and Augustine uh, and Martin Luther King of thinking through these things and developing principles for when and how uh, to resist government power in the name of your principles. I then did an episode, we, had, we talked about uh, armed revolution and rebellion, and I was against it, right? I, in this case, I was arguing that, in fact, it is not time to take up arms against the government and that the cases in which it is time for that are extremely grave and serious and not anywhere near us yet, thank God. Um, now, though, I, I think it's, I'm kind of beholden to, I owe you some answers on well, what are we supposed to do? And I've been hinting on that for a while now, but I want to really like drill down into it because the word that is going to occur, right, every time I start talking about this stuff to people is localism, right? It's kind of a buzzword of politics. People talk about local government and localism as a philosophy of what the best way to accomplish change is. But I think that's like too easy, right? It's too easy to just have a buzzword and leave it at that. We talk about the history of this idea and the theory of it and the philosophy. Um, and we have to talk about how it's supposed to answer these big problems, right? Because the whole, the enemy here is despair, right? We are, as conservatives, kind of always fighting against despair because we know that the world is broken and we know that things fall apart. And, the, and we know that the fight that we are fighting is ultimately in, the, in this world going to be a losing fight over and over again. We have to keep fighting it because we might postpone the inevitable decline. And so it's really, you know, when you're conservative, you can kind of see how everything is going wrong all the time. And that tends to despair. Um, and sometimes things do go very wrong. And we are realists about that here on this show. And so, you know, that can tend to despair too. And, and when you look out at these sweeping, they're like these vast airships passing overhead of historical trends that just look inevitable. It's like we've been talking about the, the Gracchi brothers now forever in, in Rome and these moments of popular unrest and demagoguery and, and comparing that to this moment when not only is the left rioting in the streets with impunity, but the right has taken to rioting because they feel so abandoned and um, and are furious and, and are, I think, not thinking things through, as I've now argued at great length. Um, and, and I've said before what I'll say again now, which is it doesn't actually matter whether eggheads like me sit here and approve or disapprove of riots or of insurrections or whatever. It doesn't matter whether we approve or disapprove because simply we're like we're doing the things that cause them to occur you know like that's this is what you get when people uh abandon when elites and leaders abandon their post and and treat people with such disdain right and so for a while on this show i think it's fair to say we've been tracking the trends that have led us to this place and we kind of i've been sort of saying it's kind of political philosophy 101 you kind of know that this is going to happen i feel it necessary to answer the question how uh, can i reckon with the despair that I feel when I look at the big trends in history, um, and how can I reckon with my my felt sense that there is still so much work that we can do uh, to to make this thing better? Um, and 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 when I look around at my surroundings, I find that actually there is plenty of work before me. This show is an example of something that I look around and I think, yeah, this is I can make a difference with this. And and everybody, I think, has some version of that. And also, you know, I, I notice that my emotional life is too closely tied to these big abstract national concerns and not closely tied enough to the particular realities of what's happening all around me. Like, why am I, to put it bluntly, right, why am I feeling feeling like crap when things are going great for me personally. That seems dysfunctional, even though I know that I should care and do obviously care very much about the big questions. It also seems to me wrong that the, the little questions have gotten so lost in this, and I don't think I'm the only one. Um, and so I want to talk about localism as an actual practice and a philosophy and why, um, why it might be our rescue here. Before I launch in, 
I want to bring you a word from uh, our sponsors. I really believe in their cause and their mission is the Ancient Language Institute. Um, they are building the thing that I am going to be arguing in this episode we need to build, which is an alternate institution, right? The, the academy, as I've said over and over again now, is, is pretty bankrupt morally and intellectually in a lot of places. And we need places like the Ancient Language Institute where you can just go and get a direct, hands-on, intuitive grasp of these languages that open up the entire heritage of the West to you. If you want, you can get uh, personal one-on-one -on -one instruction, which I really recommend. You can start that anytime. You go at your own pace. You get personal attention, and you can get a spot there or reserve your spot for the summer semester if you go to ancientlanguage.com slash youngheretics and get started. You get 15% off if you use the code heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, just like in the title. That's ancientlanguage.com dot com slash young heretics use the offer code heretics and get 15 percent off okay back to the show i'm going to begin talking about localism in a kind of a weird place uh and as usual i'm going to make you the promise at the beginning that we are getting to our present crisis we're going to get back around but the point of this show remember right the, the point of this classical education that you you may not have gotten or you might have been denied um, is, is to give you a deeper, longer view and to understand the sort of principles behind things. And, and, and so I'd like to um, actually talk, <laughs> of all things, about the 31st International Eucharistic Congress in Dublin. <laughs> uh, let me explain what the heck that is. So the reason that I'm talking about this is it's the site of one of G.K. Chesterton, the British Christian intellectual, one of G.K. Chesterton's um, great works. It's called Christendom in Dublin. Um, and he wrote this uh, about this event called the 31st International Eucharistic Congress, uh, which happened in 1932. Um, and, and what this is, is it's essentially a gathering, a mass gathering of the Catholic Church writ large with representatives from all over these different places, from all these different countries that are all represented by this universal church, right? And the reason that I've chosen to talk about this, well, there's a number of reasons, but one in particular is that Chesterton was looking at a community in Dublin and a country in Ireland, um, which had been through its own period of extreme turmoil and political violence and, and real kind of institutional crack up, yeah? Um, and this is something that Ireland has a long and tense history of this. You know, for going back many, many centuries, and we won't cover the whole thing. Maybe we'll do an episode just on the kind of skirmishes between Ireland um, and the United Kingdom or England. Um, and, the, you know, over the, the course of this history, um, you know, at least since the 16th century, we've had these conflicts between what you might call the indigenous Irish, the Irish people, and those whom they viewed as British invaders, right, from this other island. Um, and we've talked about the history of, of the, the English people before, right, that there's Germanic tribes sort of blending with, its, with their own indigenous culture over there. Um, but the, the question on the table is that of independent rule, right, or home rule, it's called in, in England and the UK. Um, this is the right of the Irish to govern themselves, and there have been bloody and violent conflicts over this. Um, the, the most notable one for our purposes, talking here in the early 20th century, is the Irish War of Independence, which is from 1919 to 1921. And I'm only touching on this to set the stage of Chesterton's reflections here, right? Um, essentially, what you have is you have the IRA, it's called the Irish Republican army um, fighting for independence against British forces and against, you know, Irish basically uh, client governments. So you know there are there are British appointees and and, and people who are favorable uh, to the Brits, um, including especially the Royal Irish Constabulary. Um, and this clashes basically. Uh, escalate until you also have you the British calling in their own auxiliaries, the black and tans, um, and, and they become known both for police brutality on the side of the British um, and, and what you might well call terrorism and, and civilian casualties on the side of the IRA. So it was, you know, and, and I am entering here into a conflict that is still raw and live, uh, and I have friends who are inf intimately involved in the adjudication of it. Um, so I'm not actually going to really like 
you know, come out in, in, some, in some big political proclamation about this uh, conflict, except to say that it was extremely, extremely uh, vitriolic and, and, and um, violent. And, and there, were, there was stuff that you really do not want to see. Much as I've been arguing, we've got the makings of stuff that you really do not want to see going on. You don't want extrajudicial killings. You do not want to adjudicate political conversations with these, with these outbursts of violence, with terrorism, right? Um, and, and the, uh, the religious aspect of this was also quite complicated, um, because in the, in the North, uh, in what's called Ulster, which, um, is still now part of the United Kingdom, whereas the, the South has gained essentially a, a form of independence. Um, in the North, you have this Catholic faction fighting for independence, um, and this sort of Protestant, uh, sort of really leadership that's 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 for the Brits um, and so you, you the it, in this war um, they they basically you know are they're fighting for home rule and 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 they have essentially achieved this in, in by fits and starts in, in Ireland was incorporated into the United Kingdom in what's called the act acts of union in um, 1800 but this is basically the the south's uh, just you know rebellion against that um and and so so chesterton is coming to dublin in 1932 with the memory of that still very fresh um and and observing this strange uh fit of celebration because a, a you know a eucharistic congress is a joyous affair for for reflecting upon the the universality of the church and obviously for putting aside all kinds of partisan differences not just the ones that were most recently to hand in the in the war of independence um but also you know of course the the 30s leading up to the 40s and the uh, the period really of the world wars was a time of immense contention between nation states as well and the catholic church has a presence in all of the nation states of Europe um, and and more broadly over the world, right? And so, so Chesterton is effectively reflecting on how it is that these co-religionists, right, these people who worship in the same way, are able to come together in this mass celebration of, of the Eucharist, that is communion, right, um, the, the, the sacrament of, of communion, how they're able to come together in the midst of the, this turmoil. And, and what he says about this, I think, is really um, compelling and revealing. So I'm going to quote at length from this uh, piece, Ch Christendom in Dublin. Before I quote the, the first quote, I'm going to just pause to thank you for, for being here, because we have been together now through a real, um, I think, journey on these three episodes. I, I, it's, it's been some of my, um, the most fun I've had recording the show, because we're really grappling, I think, with some urgent political questions. I hope it's been helpful for you. It's wonderful for me to, to sort of share some of my thoughts on it. And we're going to keep going. We're not going anywhere. Uh, so please do subscribe wherever you get your podcast to, to help us keep going. Uh, subscribe at, uh, you know, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, whatever. Um, and, and you can also find us now on some of the the new platforms like Minds uh, as a way of getting away from the evils of big tech, right? So minds.com slash Spencer Clavin. Finally, finally, do not forget to give a five-star review on iTunes. That really helps the show as well and spread the word. Okay, thanks thanks for being here. Um, glad you're here. Let's read Chesterton on uh, the Eucharistic Congress of 1932 in Dublin. He says, a German priest may have something to say against Poland. A Polish priest most certainly has something to say against Germany, and as each has something to say, it is possible that on proper occasion he may say something, but he will not say anything in the sense of everything and nothing. The one will not say anything that comes into his head against Germany, nor the other against Poland. The German priest will not say, we are going to make war on Poland, for as our great German sage has said, a good war justifies any cause. The Polish priest will not say, nationalism is more important than Catholicism, and if I can exalt the Polish nation, I don't care if all German Catholics go to hell. The Polish priest and the German priest as such cannot deny the dogma of justice, of the lawful loyalty to one's own nation, of the duty of extending mercy even to another nation, and so on. But the Pole and the German as such can deny anything whatever. So he's talking here about the gathering of tensions that would lead to some of the most horrific atrocities in the history of the West, right? He's talking about the lead up to World War II, uh, which is, you know, nothing to be taken lightly. And he's acknowledging what would be proven true over the course of the 
next years, which is that this, in fact, was the case in the name of a nation alone with no other higher power to share, people can do and say absolutely anything and justify it to one another. Because if their highest good is the nation alone, uh, then then the humanity of somebody in another nation is is irrelevant. But listen to what he says about the humanity of shared of, of people who share Christianity. He says, once suppose both of them to be free thinkers, and there is nothing to prevent one defending tyranny as such, and the other anarchy as such. There was a time, I know, when these crazy negotiations were supposed to be peculiar to cranks. It is even possible that they are still largely peculiar to cranks. But what is emphatically not impossible is for the cranks to become the rulers of the commonwealths. The commonwealths are drifting away from each other in ideas. As Prussia drifted away from Europe before the war, he's talking about World War I, right? As Russia drifted away from Europe after the war. How far the heresy is actually held by anybody but the heresiarchs might well be a matter of dispute, though it looks as if the heresiarchs did make a good many heretics. So he's talking here, right, about the, the, the claims of nation overtaking the claims of the church and the storm he sees brewing um, and the, the, the terrible things he sees that people might do in the name of that. The point is that before they drift too far apart, while some of them are within hailing distance, some use might be made of a central group which contains men of all countries, men generally very loyal to their countries, but men having also the quite unique advantage of a common code of law and justice and the protection of a sort of permanent courtesy more deeply founded than the fiction of diplomacy, which is called the profession of Christian charity and forbids them, at least beyond a certain point, to despise or insult or wantonly exasperate each other. There's something really profound here that he's saying about the ability of individuals to come together without giving up their individuality and their differences. This is something that we really miss, I think, in our vision of a global world nation, right? Our idea that we're all going to be one and sing kumbaya. Um, it's, it's, perfectly true that the world is becoming more global in the sense that we have easier access to each other, our communications are faster, they're more efficient. But the idea that that means we are therefore going to give up everything that makes us distinct and unique as Americans and as Germans and as Frenchmen and so forth um, is a fantasy and will lead only to tyranny, right? Because if we're all going to be the same, then we all have to be ruled under one one person, right? Um, he's Chesterton is saying the Catholic Church basically serves as the bare minimum of shared values for these people. It shares as the bedrock of the things that they believe together in their their salvation in Christ, in the, their their createdness in the image of God, um, and then leaves space for them to maintain the reality and the particularity of their nations, nationhood, their citizenship, right, who they are. This is a great truth also in friendships and personal relationships. If you've never observed this, I have only observed it recently, that one impulse of people who have like social anxiety, who like want to um, please everybody all the time, is to try and assimilate themselves to the other person. You want to sort of say, well, you know, you like this, so I'm going to pretend to like this. Um, but in fact, the, in fact, of course, true relationship is about two distinct individuals because if it's not, it's just unity. It's just oneness, right? And what you want in a relationship is actually harmony. You want two people who, who share things and have differences, right? And so the, the clearer and the more honest you are about your own self, the actually the more appealing you will be even to people who disagree with you, right? So this is the first insight that I draw both for personal and for political relationships out of Chesterton is that if you actually engage with yourself and accept yourself and, and come to understand and accept yourself, right, uh, in the, as an American, as a Christian, if you are, or a, a theist of any kind, right, a monotheist of any kind, if you are that, right, like, if, if you can grasp why you are that and, and understand and accept that you are, um, and that, that America is a certain kind of nation with, with beliefs that are different from other nations, um, you can go a long way toward having conversations with people because you actually then begin to, uh, to, 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 set, to lay the foundation for all relationship. And, and the um, combination, right, of shared values, which is kind of, I'm going to get to this, kind of what we're missing right now in America, right, the sort of shared baseline across which we then have conversations about our differences. This is crucial, right? This is how our uh, nation is supposed to function is with this sort of broad a shared set of traditions and values, and a lot of diversity within that. Let's let's keep with Chesterton for a bit before we 
really move right back to America. Um, but first, uh, one more word from one more sponsor. I'm really, really glad to be sponsored by ExpressVPN. I think they're providing a really important service. What I use VPN for is you, I, I turn it on and then the IP address is basically scrambled through an encrypted server, which is their own, belongs to this company. Uh, it makes it harder for, for them to, for, for big tech companies to basically identify me. So um, it's an app. You can get it on your, uh, on your phone, right? And all you do, visit expressvpn.com slash heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, to get three months free on a one-year package. It's just one click of a button. You download the app and you're protected. Uh, that's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash heretics, just like in the title of the show. Okay, back to the show. Let's return to a little bit more of what Chesterton has to say about the relationship between sort of universal values and particular government. This is one of the most famous parts of this, of this text. Lenin said, he writes, that religion is the opium of the people. This profound remark will readily explain the sleepy submission, the supine placidity, the dull and drowsy obedience of the Irish people. If you're not hearing the sarcasm dripping from every word, then you're not listening, right? As compared with the wild revolutionary frenzy, the incessant insurrection and revolt, the bloody riots and endless street battles of the English people. This is a joke because the English people are sort of known for staid law and order, and the Irish, of course, have been rebelling since like forever. Nobody who has been in Dublin for a week, as I have been during the Eucharistic Congress, can doubt that Ireland is passionately religious, and especially that the Irish populace is passionately religious. It therefore follows by the strict logic of Lenin that the Irish populace has always been particularly patient and subservient and contended. Nobody who has lived in England all his life, as I have, can doubt that modern England, with its many manly and generous virtues, has become largely indifferent to religion. It follows, therefore, by the strict logic of Lenin that the English are the best Bolshevists in the world. <laughs> to suppose anything else would be to indulge in the audacity, nay, the blasphemy of supposing that there is something wrong in the logic of Lenin, right? So he's suggesting that religion is almost the opposite of an opiate to the masses, right? Which is Lenin's famous statement. Um, Chesterton says, we must therefore believe as best we can that the Irishman has always been a tame and timid person, and that it is the Englishman who has always been again the government. The inference is that it is only by believing in God that we could ever possibly believe in the government. But the truth is that it is only by believing in God that we can ever criticize the government. Once abolish the God and the government becomes the God, that fact is written across all human history, but it is written most plainly across that recent history of Russia, which was created by Lenin. <laughs> there the government is the God, and all the more the God, because it proclaims aloud in accents of thunder, like every other God worth worshipping, the one essential commandment, thou shalt have no other gods but me. Lenin only fell into a slight error. He only got it the wrong way round. The truth is that irreligion is the opium of the people. Wherever the people do not believe in something beyond the world, they will worship the world. But above all, they will worship the strongest thing in the world. I really want to stress this because this is going to be the heart of the insight that I'm trying to bring to this question, right? Right now, it is very easy to think that we are in a battle between religious people, especially of the Abrahamic faith, so Christianity, Judaism, and, and Islam, although to a, Islam to a lesser extent in America, but still, right? A battle between relig religious believers and, and secularists, right? And secular uh, people who, who, you know, at, at Neil Gorsuch in the Supreme Court case that defended some religious liberties against coronavirus lockdown said, oh, it's so funny that, that public health aligns with secular values so you can go get a drink but you can't go to church, right? Reading Chesterton reveals that that is only a small part of the picture. On a deeper level, what we are really fighting is a fight between belief in the real God and belief in the God of government. You can prove this very, very easily if you just listen to what our new leaders are saying. In Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser declared Anthony Fauci Day with great pomp and circumstance for the man who has led us through this trying time and been a force for light. Anthony Fauci Day is on the birthday of Anthony Fauci, which is December 24th, 
right? No mention of this was made. It's Christmas Eve, right? So they've replaced Christmas Eve with Anthony Fauci. When, when the Democrats won in Georgia, in the Georgia Senate race, Gretchen Whitmer tweeted out, this is the governor of Michigan, tweeted out that she was lighting prayer candles to Stacey Abrams, the, the failed Georgia governor candidate. You can watch this happening everywhere. And the riots of summer 2020, when people were being demanded to kneel and recite right, racialist dogmas and creeds, right? The fact of the matter is that, as Chesterton says, right, human beings worship. We hold something in the highest possible esteem and remove God from that place and you worship the most powerful thing and the most powerful thing is the government. This is what is preventing us from doing what would be called localism, right? Localism is that thing where you are committed to the particularity of your immediate environs because you trust that everybody else is committed to that particularity with some shared sense of something. And in America, that is a, a creator, right? It's not actually any Christian, particular Christian sect by design, but a, the belief in a creator, the belief that he calls you to the good, the belief that he wants man to be free. To revive this, we quite simply need a religious revival. And I know that there's a lot of argument out there that the American revolution is in some way the secularizing revolution it doesn't make any sense. The word creator is in the, is in the text, right? Endowed by your creator. And so th the, that is what we are actually fighting. We are trying to get away from this worship of government, which has taken over because of our blindness about how all of this works, right? So we're trying first and foremost to reorient ourselves in our local communities to the good and what the good looks like right around you, right next to you. Because the thing about the good, right, in the sense of like God's will and God's desire for you is that it's actually this, you know, vast, infinite thing that's beyond your comprehension. But because the incarnation is real, right, it comes down into these particular moments. And each moment, there's some distinct thing that doesn't necessarily look like what the guy three towns over is doing, but has shared with what the guy is doing, the fact that it's all the good, right? So, so this is the first thing is like, in order to reconstitute American excellence, right? What we first have to do is find out what the good looks like in our immediate environment. The more of us do that, the more there will organically emerge a shared vision of the good for all of the country. This is why you don't get there by first proclaiming a big national movement. The left didn't do that. The left did not do that. They, they have been, as I said last week, they've been playing this ground game forever. And the reason is, if you say, I am going to proclaim a project for a new national political party, then immediately you are going to get things wrong. You're going because you, it's, it's too sweeping. You don't have enough information. You don't know what's going to come down the pike. The first thing you need to do is find out what's like, who's your local representative? Does he represent your values? I don't care if he's Republican or Democrat, whatever. A lot of Republicans are like, not that great. So go out and find out, right? Does he represent what you believe? And then Find out if your neighbor is also having some of the same concerns. And find out if you can share together a few ideas about what is good. If you can talk about like three things that you believe is like the, the best ideal, you will actually be well on your way to something emerging that will have national import. This is actually the idea behind one of the most innovative defenses of our American Constitution. Because remember, back when the American Constitution came into being, it was kind of, well, it was revolutionary to coin a phrase, right? But it was also, it was, rev it was radical in a, in a ton of ways. And there were a lot of objections to it. And you have to remember that what, what the founders were thinking about was a lot of the classical stuff that we have been talking about on this show. Um, all that stuff that we've been talking about, republics, the tripartite scheme, Polybius, Cicero, Livy, Aristotle, Plato, Herodotus, we're talking about all of these guys at some point, they all have this idea that if you can combine the different kinds of government, monarchy, uh, aristocracy, and democracy, if you can combine them and balance their flaws against each other and get people to participate in that and engage and have like social buy-in to that, then you've got the best form of government because it can like it, you can have these checks and balances and so forth. There was a, an argument going around in uh, the lead up to the revolution that was particularly well expressed by, by Montesquieu. Uh, this is, you may have heard this name. His full name is Charles de Seconda, Baron de Montesquieu, right? So this is like a, you know, one, of these French, one of these French guys, you know. Um, and in 1748, he publishes The Spirit of the Laws, 
Um, and it made a huge impact. And one of the things he says in, in that text is, it is natural to a republic to have only a small territory, otherwise it cannot long subsist. Why? Because participation in and, and investment in these forms of government is crucial for self-government. You, know, you need people who are going to actually be invested in these questions and are going to be, you know, fronting their own time and energy and honor into making things work between all these different classes and, and kind of making compromise and so forth. Of course, the backdrop of that, as I have been saying, is some shared sense of the good, some something toward which, even if you're working toward it in one way and the other guy's working toward it in another way, it's the same thing on some, on some deeper level, right? Um, and in Chesterton, that's the Catholic Church. In America, the idea is that that will be America, which has a, a theist component to it, but also involves I, consequences of that, like liberty and so forth. So this was an argument that really needed to be sort of answered by the founders. They, they had to find some way that 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 same process, which works well if you've got like a couple towns together, right, you know, sort of each doing their own version of the same good, right? Uh, they had to find some way to make that ubiquitous, like it, all over this this big extended republic. And the danger against which they were fighting was what they called faction. And that is exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing partisanship where we each have our own distinct visions of the good. We're attached to the high, like our own highest good, our own form of worship. Um, and, and we therefore look at each other and can't understand or make common cause with each other because we don't share any common vision of the good. So he's saying, how, how, does this, how does this work? Like, how do we sort of make this work without de devolving into what we've de devolved into now? And, and he writes, this is, this is Madison um, in 1787 in the New York Packet. The latent causes of faction are sown in the nature of man, and we see them everywhere brought into different degrees of activity according to the different circumstances of civil society. A zeal for different opinions concerning religion, concerning government, and many other points, as well of speculation as of practice, an attachment to different leaders ambitiously contending for preeminence and power, or to persons of other descriptions whose fortunes have been interesting to the human passions, have in turn divided my mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. That's a perfect description, right, of everything that I've just been saying. That is exactly what I'm saying is our problem. So strong is this propensity of mankind to fall into mutual animosities that where no substantial occasion presents itself, the most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle their unfriendly passions and excite their most violent conflicts. But the most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Also sounds familiar, right? Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. I've said this now several times, that class conflict is essential, essentially sort of ineradicable from a republic on some level. Um, those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. Those who are creditors and those who are debtors fall under a like discrimination. A landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a mercantile interest, a moneyed interest with many lesser interests grow up of necessity in civilized nations and divide them into different classes, actuated by different sentiments and views. The regulation of these various and interfering interests forms the principal task of modern legislation and involves the spirit of party and faction in the necessary and ordinary operations of the government. No man is allowed to be a judge in his own cause, because his interest would certainly bias his judgment and not improbably corrupt his integrity. With equal, nay, with greater reason, a body of men are unfit to be both judges and parties at the same time. Yet, what are many of the most important acts of legislation, but so many judicial determinations, not indeed concerning the rights of single persons, but concerning the rights of large bodies of citizens? So he's making the argument for yeah, an independent uh, body of, of judges, essentially, to, to adjudicate on this. And what are the different classes of legislature, legislators but advocates and parties to the causes which they determine? Is a law proposed concerning private debts? It is a question to which the creditors are parties on one side and the debtor, debtors on the other. Justice ought to hold the balance between them, yet the parties are and must be themselves the judges. Now, um, he's, he goes on like this for, for, a, for a bit to sort of elucidate the ways in which faction is kind of irrevocable. There's no way to, to just remove it. Uh, and, and this is one of, one of his most brilliant arguments. He says, the inference um, 
to which we are brought is that the causes of faction cannot be removed, he says, without removing liberty. It's essentially, the only way to keep people from forming factions is to tell them what to think. And you can't do that. You, you must not do that. Uh, and, and that relief is only sought, therefore, in the means of controlling factions' effects. If a faction consists of less than a majority, relief is supplied by the Republican principle, which enables the majority to defeat its sinister views by regular vote. It may clog the administration, it may convulse the society, but it will be unable to execute and mask its violence under the forms of the Constitution. When a majority is included in a faction, the form of popular government, on the other hand, enables it to sacrifice to its ruling passion or interest both the public good and the rights of other citizens. Now he's getting down to really the, the heart of it here. Right? How can we stop a majority faction from trampling all over the rights of anything else? By what means is this object attainable? Evidently by one of two only. Either the existence of the same passion or interest in a majority at the same time must be prevented, or the majority, having such coexistent passion or interest, must be rendered by their number and local situation unable to concert and carry into effect schemes of oppression. If the impulse and the opportunity be suffered to coincide, we well know that neither moral nor religious motives can be relied on as an adequate control. They are not found to be such on the injustice and violence of individuals and lose their efficacy in proportion to the number combined together. That is, in proportion as their efficacy becomes needful. So now this is essentially the positive version of the negative argument that Hamilton was making last week. So remember last week I talked about how Hamilton says, in a country as big as ours, you need to be able to convince a lot of different people if you're going to stage a revolution. Madison is saying that is a strength in preventing our, the crack up of our regime, because in order to get anything done on the national level, you're going to have to combine with one another. You're going to have to make alliances and allegiances, um, and, you're, and you're gonna have to essentially uh, give and take and, and, and make compromise. And so this is the next step, right? So if you are looking around you at your immediate surroundings and you're thinking, what is the good? In order to make that happen, you're going to have to talk to a couple other people. You're going to have to talk to your neighbor. You're going to have to talk to the people, you know, in, in city council or what have you, or in, on your school board, for example, if, if the, some of the major problems that you're concerned with have to do with like education, right? And essentially, the, the deeper you invest in the particularities of your life, the more you will learn what the actual good is and looks like. And the more people are doing that, across the country, right? Whatever their previous political affiliation is, whatever you currently, if you currently think that the oppression of big tech and the, uh, you know, failures of our elite class are a serious problem, if you believe in, in freedoms of speech and, and association, right, then you are part of this coalition that, that will be building even before it knows that it is building, right? The deeper you invest in the good of the place where you are, the more you will be playing into Madison's hand, which is what you want, right? You want to be forcing yourself to make the compromises that can, can build a coalition in favor of a shared American vision of the good. This is Chesterton's observation sort of borne out in an American way, right? Because here in, in Dublin for Chesterton, right, people are profoundly invested in their home life, right? They're, they're really wrapped up in these intense political conflicts, and yet they have to come together around this enormous worldwide thing, which is the Eucharist. And he gives a very beautiful description of it. He says, to take but one instance, this is Chesterton again, I confess I was myself enough of an outsider to feel flash through my mind as the illimitable multitude began to melt away toward the gates and the roads and bridges, the instantaneous thought, this is democracy, and everybody is saying there is no such thing. I do not mean it in any merely sentimental or even merely sympathetic sense. I do not mean anything about brotherhood or fellowship or social idealism. I mean it in the definite, distant sense of the actual Greek word. I mean the crowd ruling itself like a king. If there is one thing about which the modern mind is utterly skeptical, it is this. It is far more skeptical about this than about any ancient miracle, even the miracle of the mass. It is nonsense to say that no scientific modern minds now believe in the mass. But it is very nearly true to say that no scientific modern minds now believe in the mob. If we take all the current statements about the gradual decay of all dogmas of Christianity, we shall find that they are pretty roughly true. If we apply them to the dogmas of democracy, the commonest form of denial, especially among the most cultivated and capable critics, is the denial of that dogma of Rousseau, which is called the general will. 
The humanists of America, the fascists of Italy, even the Bolshevists of Russia, all the most recent schools have revolutionized the old revolutionary tradition. All dismiss this democratic mystery as a myth. There is no such thing as a general will. How could there be a general will? Now it is quite certain that a general will walked about the streets of Dublin for a week. It is quite certain that there was practical harmony because there was theoretical un unity. There was truly and actually in the threadbare and vulgarized phrase of the politicians, a will of the people, and it did prevail. What he's saying here is that it's not actually your job to orchestrate the entire course of history. It's your job to invest yourself as deeply as possible to the part of the course of history that is right outside of your door right now, right? There is stuff. I, I do not want to be a Pollyanna. I don't want to sell you false optimism. There is stuff that we simply, you and I, cannot fix right now. And stuff that, you know, has the potential to get real bad, you know? And, and from where I stand, we don't even really have a national party right now that can really mount a cogent response to it. You know, Republicans don't really seem to understand how bad the problem is. Democrats are the problem, in my opinion. We're going to have to build back better, as they say, um, but not in the way that that slogan is typically used. Instead, we have to recognize that, you know, we're kind of forced back on our basics here. And the basics are not, you know, how am I going to fix the republic? The basics are, how are you going to fix what's outside your door? And if you can genuinely invest yourself emotionally and intellectually in that and do it every day, the way that you lift weights, right? You don't lift weights like one time and get super ripped. You do it every day, slowly for a long time. And you do what, what Augustus famously said was festina lente, hurry slowly. Um, and the, the, there's a Greek version of it too, spelde bradeos. Um, that's our task right now because we've got like a lot of work to do, rebuilding a new academy, building our own tech infrastructure that can go around these smarmy oligarchs. You know, uh, building either, you know, rehabilitating the Republican Party or building a new party. And it all, it all has to happen by answering the immediate needs first and building outward from there to find what's common among all of the good endeavors that we are doing, each of us individually in our separate spheres. This is the philosophy of localism. This is what it means to say, not just, oh, you know, think globally, act locally. Um, there's something much, much more profound here about the, what you are and what you have to offer the world. Um, I want to, in the last uh, few minutes here, I want to spend some time with an author who really is a um, kind of beloved prophet of localism, even though he's not a conservative. Um, and this is Wendell Berry. He was actually a big environmentalist. Um, and he was a farmer in Kentucky throughout the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. Um, and his, he's mostly an essayist, um, and he, he's a very, very eloquent writer, and he has a lot to say. You know, he's one of these great, I'm going to talk next week, I think, about Camille Pagli, who's another person who's like this. It's like, you know, there's a lot of benefit to reading smart people who are outside your intellectual sphere. And, you know, th there's a lot of, like, dumb people out there, and I am known for sort of dismissing, you know, I dismiss identity politics. I don't think it's worth my time to engage with but there is a lot of like wit and insight and and wisdom in these people who like are not politically aligned with me, but still have this incredibly developed vision of the world. Wendell Berry is one of them. Um, I'm reading these essays out of a collection, which I really recommend called The World Ending Fire, The Essential Wendell Berry. And I'm going to read from an essay whose, whose title I kind of hate, but which gets across some of the ideas I'm talking about. It's called Think Little. Um, and I'm not actually talking about thinking little. I'm talking about, think, I'm talking about how to correctly think big and effectively think big. So he's talking here about the environmentalist movement, but it, it applies to much more than that. He says, Odd as I am sure it will appear to some, I can think of no better form of personal involvement in the cure of the environment than that of gardening. A person who is growing a garden, if he is growing it organically, is improving a piece of the world. He is producing something to eat, which makes him somewhat independent of the grocery business, but he is also enlarging for himself the meaning of food, and the pleasure of eating. The food he grows will be fresher, more nutritious, less contaminated by poisons and preservatives, and dyes than what he can buy at a store. He is reducing the trash problem. A garden is not a disposable container, and it will digest and reuse its own wastes. If he enjoys working in his garden, then he is less dependent on an automobile or a merchant for his pleasure. He is involving himself directly in the work of feeding people. If you think I'm wandering off the subject, 
Let me remind you that most of the vegetables necessary for a family of four can be grown on a plot of 40 by 60 feet. I think we might see in this an economic potential of considerable importance, since we now appear to be facing the possibility of widespread famine. How much food could be grown in the dooryards of cities and suburbs? How much could be grown along the extravagant right-of-ways of the interstate system? Or how much could be grown by the in intensive practices and economics of the garden or small farm, or on so-called marginal lands? Louis Bromfield liked to point out that the people of France survived crisis after crisis because they were a nation of gardeners, who in times of want turned with great skill to their own small plots of ground. And F. H. King, an agriculture professor who traveled extensively in the Orient in 1907, talked to a Chinese farmer who supported a family of 12, one donkey, one cow, and two pigs on 2.5 acres of cultivated land, and who did this, moreover, by agricultural methods that were sound enough to have maintained his land in prime fertility through several thousands of years of such use. These are possibilities that are readily apparent and attractive to minds that are prepared to think little. To big thinkers, the bureaucrats and businessmen of agriculture, they are invisible. But intensive, organic agriculture kept the farms of the Orient thriving for thousands of years, whereas extensive, which is to say exploitative or extractive agriculture, has critically reduced the fertility of American farmland in a few centuries or even a few decades. A person who undertakes to grow a garden at home by practices that will preserve rather than exploit the economy of the soil has set his mind decisively against what is wrong with us. He is helping himself in a way that dignifies him and that is rich in meaning and pleasure. But he is doing something else that is more important. He is making vital contact with the soil and the weather on which his life depends. He will no longer look upon rain as a traffic impediment or upon the sun as a holiday decoration. And his sense of humanity's dependence on the world will have grown precise enough, one would hope, to be politically clarifying and useful. Now, you would, you would do wrong to dismiss this guy as a crunchy granola environmentalist. I know that some of the stuff he's talking about sounds like a little bit like that, a little Greenpeace. Um, and actually, I am not in any way qualified to comment on the merits of his agricultural ideas. Um, I think my, my, my suspicion is that some of them are good and some of them are a bit uh, idealistic and naive. But the point that he's making is much, much deeper than gardening, right? He's talking about the relationship that you form with the world when you're engaging in it as it actually is right around you. Um, I think about this sometimes in, in terms of like lifting weights, right? People say like, oh, lifting weights is like this lunkhead thing that you do on the side of your of your uh, intellectual work. It's not the case, right? If you have to reckon with the realities of your physical body, it stops you from getting abstracted off into these like weird dithering things. Intellectuals are very good at this, right? They're, they're very good at sort of dithering away into stuff that's not actually about anything real. Um, if, you, if you genuinely force yourself to handle what's right in front of you, you will find that your relationship to politics and to the world becomes more healthy and sane. Think again about where your emotional landscape is oriented. What's the true north of your inner life, right? Is it something a million miles away from you that doesn't have any discernible effects on you? Or is it something that is right in front of you that you can actually involve yourself in and change, right? There's got to be something dysfunctional about living more in your imagination of what's going on in the whole country than about what's going on right around you. If you wake up every day and you're actually like happy in your personal life, then you, but you're nevertheless despairing in your heart because of what's going on in the, on the global stage, something is wrong about the way you're thinking about the world. Something is not, you know, wrong in the sense of bad. It's just wrong in the sense of it's not helping you any. It's not helping you to do the stuff that you are supposed to be doing. If, on the other hand, you have genuine problems that are bothering you, in, like right outside your door, then that's the thing to work on and to devote all of your energy to. Because if you can't solve that problem, you're not actually going to solve the vast national problem, right? So, so let, your, let the stuff that we talk about on the show and your national concerns inform the stuff that you think about. So if I know, for example, that I'm really interested in and invested in solutions to the educational what I think is an educational crisis, but I'm, I'm looking for ways to do that in real life and not to like sign some national petition, nothing against national petitions exactly, but I just think that you, you need a way to be forced into reckoning with the reality of the world right in front of you. Um, there's one more Wendell Berry passage that I want to read that reckons with this from, I think, one of his best essays, Nature as Measure. And in this, he sort of talks about this, this sense of reality that I'm, I'm talking about. He says, and he's again, of course, talking about farming. He says, farming cannot take place except in nature. Therefore, if nature does not thrive, farming cannot thrive. But we know, too, that nature includes us. 
It is not a place into which we reach from some safe standpoint outside it. We are in it and are a part of it while we use it. If it does not thrive, we cannot thrive. The appropriate measure of farming, then, is the world's health and our health, and this is inescapably one measure. But the oneness of this measure is far different from the singularity of the standard of productivity that we have been using. It is far more complex. One of its concerns, one of the inevitable natural measures, is productivity. But it is also concerned for the health of all the creatures belonging to a given place, from the creatures of the soil and water to the humans and other creatures of the land, surface, to the birds of the air. The use of nature as measure proposes an atonement between ourselves and the world, between economy and ecology, between the domestic and the wild. Or it proposes a conscious and careful recognition of the interdependence between ourselves and nature that has in fact always existed and, if we are to live, must always exist. Now remember, always on this show, and I think here as well, the word nature means more than just like grass and trees, right? He's talking about the whole order of the cosmos and the whole essential way in which we both fit into it and shape it, but also are, are ourselves shaped by it. And if you have a vast grand theory about how to fix the whole world, but you can't make the people around you conform to that theory, there's something wrong with the theory, right? And so by investing in local politics and by getting out there into your school system and, and figuring out what's wrong and talking to your neighbors about it, right? You will actually discover the things that are more necessary to do also on the national scale than you will by shouting and theorizing about what has to happen at the national level, about where we're going to go in the next 10, 20, 30 years. You don't know that. And, and the other thing is that, you know, even though, again, it's important to think in these large, large scale terms, right? You actually, like, don't have as much of an effect in those terms as, as you think you do unless you are first digging into the realities of what's going on in your life and around you. Especially, right, if, if, if the central problem, and this is why I argue this, if the central problem is that we're addicted to other gods besides actual God, right, what's your spiritual life like? Like, how often do you pray? You know, and, and I don't mean I don't mean that in the in quite in like the like how many times a day. I just mean like, are you are you in a relationship with God? Like, are you are you thinking about that? And is your personal life like representative of the kind of thing that you hope will come into being in the rest of the world? Because like, the way to do that is to invest in that and to start you know find a church that's open. I know I've said this a million times. Gather people around you who are like minded on this subject. And develop and grow organic relationships that come out of your investment in the actual things that, that genuinely enrich your life and your family and your community. And you will, in fact, find that when you meet up then with other people who have been doing that in their area, and they will have specifics that are different from yours, but they will be recognizably Americans. And we will eventually get back to the place where we can unite this into a cogent national policy that will win elections and all the stuff that we want. It'll, it'll get the Senate back and the, you know, all the stuff we like to pump our fists about. But we have to go through a real period of, of reckoning again with reality because this stuff that the Republicans are failing to address, that's not an accident. Like, the, the national systems are the, are the things that are most broken, that are most disconnected from the fact that China has become this big global competitor. The fact that Global free markets are a, like a complete failure and, the, and that really national free markets are, are, are the only things that are really working the way they're supposed to. I repeat again, festina lente. Ask the small questions first. Ask them every day and make your progress slowly but with purpose and urgency. Remember that urgency is not panic. And remember also that when we talk about the general will and when we talk about investing in the good, which will one day unite us all under the same good, we are talking about God who actually exists and is actually on our side. So be not afraid and get to work. Let's do the mailbag. As I have said a million times, here is a good example of a thing that is directly in my life that I am trying to fix. I have built up a following on Twitter. That is one of the ways that I have like gotten to know all of you guys and gotten this show out there and so forth. Twitter is evil. Twitter is part of the problem. They are silencing voices. They have unparalleled power. It is something that we need to fix. 
And so I am now like you notice that I have started to diversify and try to get off of there. I've got a following like you like the content that ho hopefully that I'm putting out there in our relationship. We can actually make a difference to what will eventually be a national movement of breaking big tech and salting the earth whence it arose. Um, but anyway, all of that as a way of saying this mailbag question does come to me on Twitter. Um, it's from at dying underscore democracy an appropriate uh, handle for this particular topic. A mailbag question for Spencer Clavin for Young Heretics. A little behind, just finished episode 30. What would you, Clavin, son of Clavin, no relation, do if you owned an invisibility ring? So this is referring back to the Ring of Gyges, which I talked about in episode 30. And this is, um, or actually maybe early, I can't remember. But in any case, the Ring of Gyges is this story that gets retold a couple times. And in, in Herodotus, there's no ring. It's just this uh, guy that's asked to spy on his, essentially his king's wife. Uh, when she's undressing. In, in Plato, it's this guy that has a, a, an invisible ring that's kind of it's part of the inspiration for Lord of the Rings and so forth. The point of it being, if you, if you were made invisible, would you still be just and virtuous or would you just do like whatever you could? Um, and this is the funny thing, like I have this, the, the hope in one's heart never dies that one would actually be good if one had no consequences. Um, and one aspires to that, right? One aspires, as we talked about when we talked about Aristotle, but one aspires to love the good and do the good for its own sake. And yet, theology and one's repeated experience encourages one to insist to oneself that actually one would do terrible things. Um, but I don't want to over, I don't want to overstate that, right? Human depravity is not just like the bad things that you do. It's, it's the impulses that are in your heart. So I think that I would have like kind of impulses to like, I don't know, I, like, the worst impulses that I would have would be to like do terrible things to Gavin Newsom. Uh, and the best impulses that I would have would be to like, uh, you know, secretly just go on doing what I do now when people look at me. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, I wish I had a, like a, a cooler answer to this, except that I think like the, the, the really, the truth of it that I think is that if you think that you would just do good, you're missing the point of the story. Like you, everybody thinks that. And you actually don't know until you have the opportunity what you will do. Because temptation, the thing about temptation is it's actually very tempting. <laughs> like you have to, you, you have to steal yourself against it, but you also have to just rely on God in that moment to give you, to give you grace to resist the temptation. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I'm always very wary of of indulging in my fantasies that I am a good person. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that they ring of, this question sort of invites me to do that and I want to resist that. Uh, it was a really, it's a really fun question. Uh, I hope that's a good answer. And I uh, will see you next week. It's really great to be here with you always. This, this concludes the three-part cycle that we've been doing about what the heck to do. It's been, as I said, I think before, it's been some of the most fun I've had uh, doing Young Heretics. And I hope you liked it. Uh, if you like this stuff, you will love the Claremont Institute where I work. Uh, I'm an editor at the, both the American Mind, which is our online publication, and the Claremont Review of Books, which you can also find online, but it's also in print. Um, I write there, but so do many other people who are much smarter than me. And uh, you can donate to support the work that we do in defense of the American ideals at claremont.org slash donate and let them know that we sent you. All right, this is Young Heretics. Thanks for joining. I will see you next week for more Truth beauty and the stuff that matters.